Hey friends, welcome to episode 50 of the Cohesive Home Podcast. In today's episode, I talk to homeschool mom and entrepreneur, Jennifer Pepito. We chat about the seasons of life and knowing when it's time to change, and then also how to make those changes with a large family. We also talk about why she chooses essentialism over minimalism, and then living intentionally as a family and creating great memories together during the holiday season. With seven kids of her own, she knows a lot about purposeful parenting and creating a cohesive home. I know that you're going to absolutely love this conversation that I had with Jennifer, so listen on. So Jennifer, welcome to our podcast. I'm so excited to have you with us today. And I would love for you to just it, kind of introduce yourself to our listeners. I know some that are listening may already know who you are, um, but tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are right now. Oh my goodness. Well, we got to where we are right now through a lot of moves, actually. We have seven kids. The oldest is 25 and the youngest is nine. And I think that my husband and I have a little bit of a love for adventure. So in our lives, we've lived in a trailer, we've lived off the grid, we've often lived on property. And then just a year ago, we downsized into a small house still with um, at least six of our seven kids at home. So we're kind of adventurous and I also homeschool. So my Peaceful Press company produces some parent guides for connection and learning that is developmentally appropriate for children. Mm -hmm. And we just try to live an intentional life with our big family. So we now we downsized a year ago and we live on a smaller acreage in a smaller house because we took a trip as a family to Tanzania, Africa, with all seven of our kids and just realized how much we as a family really, really love traveling together. And that kind of made us reassess our lifestyle that we were living at the time, which was on a five acre property that was kind of farmland. And so it took a lot of work trying to keep it up. And so when we discovered, you know, we're always kind of working on our essentials. We love the book by Greg McEwen and essentialism. So we're always kind of working on our essentials. And at that point we realized that, a lot of people in our family weren't actually into farming and the brunt of the yard work or managing the farm life was falling on me. Mm-hmm. And so as a family, we just decided that what we really wanted to do was simplify our lives and, and gear ourselves up as a family to be able to travel. We knew that our daughter was going to be looking at going to law school in, in the UK. And so we sold our five acre 22,000 something square foot house and bought a 1.8 acre, 1400 square foot house. Wow. That is awesome. I, I think it is so interesting because within the homeschool world, you always see people wanting that land and wanting the farm and the things to cultivate within the homeschool. And yet I think that's so cool that you guys chose to say, okay, that's not, that's not right even though this is great, we thought this is what we wanted and you were able to pivot and make that decision to change. Right. And it was all about seasons too. Like it was the right thing probably for a season. We lived there for six years and during my, I have four boys and three girls. So my three older boys lived through fixer upper lifestyle. And, and for, for them, there was a lot of character building that went with that because they did have to learn to, you know, take care of animals or help out with home projects. And I think that knowing how to work is a skill that everybody should have. It's kind of an integral skill to success in life. And that did develop a real work ethic in my sons today. They're out working for neighbors, but there does come a time when your kids get older that they want to work for somebody else for money. Mm-hmm. instead of working for you for free. So yep. <laughs> um, so it, it was just seasonal. It was it was that my kids are getting older and they were going away to school. And we realized that, okay, 
do my husband and I really want to manage this land by ourselves? Or is there something else that we want in kind of the later years of our parenting and our life together as a family? So within this season that you guys were transitioning to, um, that was just this last year, right? Yes, we basically in 2016, we went to Africa and Ireland on a like a three week family trip. And so that was what really precipitated this new idea, because up until then, we'd gone on driving trips, we'd gone camping, we'd never really taken a big international trip like that as a family. Mm -hmm. And so that just the excitement about that and how well we worked together with navigating airports and uh, all of that Mm -hmm. definitely gave us a new vision for something we could do as a family. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. That sounds like us. We love that stuff. I love travel, especially with kids. I feel like it's kind of a, we always joke in our family, we call it our amazing race training. And so when we're in like a, a difficult thing, we're like, okay, amazing race. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a really bonding experience. It is. I felt so close to my family at that point um, when we were traveling. And I just, I, I long for that again. So that is, so did you guys go over and see your, you said your daughter moved uh, to the UK? Yes. Well, basically, in so in 2016, for Christmas, we decided to forego Christmas gifts. And we went to Ireland and spent Christmas with an aunt and uncle who lived there. So we were able to stay with them. And they kind of toured us around to some of the castles. And then from Ireland, we flew to Tanzania and did a marriage conference on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro for our group oh, of missionaries. Stop it. <laughs> I know. It was it was amazing on so many levels because my husband and I, we were missionaries. We lived in a travel trailer. We lived off the grid and we kind of hated each other. And so we really want to help families who are living in intense situations like that yes. with some tools for pulling together. So we went and did that little mini conference and it was just so amazing. Our whole family got to do it together. The kids were doing a kid's camp at the same time. So it was just a precious experience. And that's when we came home and started thinking, huh, maybe what we really want to do is, is this is travel together as a family is be able to do more, uh, kind of outreach work like that. Mm -hmm. And so we got home and started talking and, um, in our spiritual journey, praying about it. And then put our house on the market. And in June of 2017, sold our house and moved. And it was a kind of a nasty process because we could close on the fixer upper we bought in time to move our stuff to it. So we had to move to this little temporary company house for the organization my husband works for. And it was really small. It was one bathroom. And at, at one point, all seven of my kids were home and it was really, it was in a little neighborhood kind of, and we hadn't lived, you know, we'd lived out on property where if I needed to call my children to come in for supper, I could holler, yeah. you know, <laughs> but we were in a little neighborhood where my husband worked with everybody. So there was no hollering there. Oh. <laughs> so we lived there for, uh, like the, the shortest possible amount of time, I think it was about three or four months and then moved into our fixer upper, which at the time did not have a kitchen. So we, we did a laundry room sink and an instant pot and a rice cooker Mm -hmm. for a couple months just before Thanksgiving, we have a kitchen done. But when we sold our house, we also put away a little, I told my husband, if I had to live in that company house, then he had to take me to Italy for Christmas. Awesome. (laughs) So, so that's last. Yes, I know it was actually. So in 20 Christmas of 2017, we flew to Italy with carry-ons only. So we spent three weeks in Italy with just carry-ons or backpacks and spent Christmas in a small medieval flat in the, the, or the city of Assisi. Oh my gosh. Which which is where St. Francis, we were on a St. Francis journey. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I love that. It was, it was kind of incredible. That's really cool. Okay. Yeah. We just need a whole other podcast. Um, talking about that. (laughs) Ah. That's so cool. Um, so when you guys got back and you knew that you wanted to make that transition, what were some of the first steps that you had to take in order to prepare for that? Yeah. I mean, partly 
we really spent time as an entire family talking and praying about it because we didn't want to make a, a move, you know, sell our children's home that they'd only, some of them had only known that place yeah. without really having everybody on board. Right. Uh, so we really talked about it because it was also, my daughter was going to be graduated from college at the same time. And we didn't want to just bring a lot more stress into the life, but we, we did sell the house and we got rid of a lot of stuff, yeah. but at the house that we sold, we had almost a full library. We had two living areas. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing I've really had a hard time downsizing on is our books. I kind of feel like I'm a oh. curator culture when I keep books. Yes. So, so the new house has less living space and a lot less storage space. So we've really had to be fairly aggressive about saying, you know, do I need this? Right. Uh, is this really an essential for us? Books? Yeah, that is one thing that when we went through our downsize, like, well, I should say downsize, we've always kind of slowly downsized, but say when we moved to Germany or whatever, we got rid of so many books. And now we look back and we're like, why did we do that? So we are definitely like my husband and I now we are like, let's just buy more bookshelves. We're fine. We're still minimalist, but we love books. <laughs> so right. It's and, priorities. And, yeah. And I think like for us, our my my whole goal in life is not necessarily minimalism, but my I definitely am very much an essentialist about where I spend money. And so that's more uh, more my motivation is like I would rather put money away for a trip than buy a bunch of decorations for a holiday. You know, there's certain, or, or I'd rather buy a few used clothing items than be like totally up with the trends right. and then have more money for a trip. So, right. you know, it's more, it's more for us, our minimalism is more about essentialism right. I and, love and our essential would be travel and kind of like outreach work. Very well said. Yeah. I think that um, when you know your priorities and when you know your values and you know what you want for your family, those essentials just kind of like rise to the top, you know, and you see them so much clearly and clearer. So that's awesome. I think one of the best things about this downsize has been the family togetherness. And we, we always kind of prioritized family evenings and that kind of thing. But because in this house, we only have one living area mm -hmm. and there's less space to spread out. We do have some really sweet evening times as a family where we, we read aloud together, we play music together. And, you know, I think that when you live in a closer space, sometimes there's more opportunity for conflict, but we've definitely seen an opportunity as well for us to kind of pull closer together as a family. Yeah. So that is, that is something I really wanted to touch on was how, how does it look with as many children as you have home now? Cause do you have six at home now or are two of them gone? So you have five. Um, okay. So I still have six kids at home part time and over the summer, all seven were home, which was amazing. But so in the house, we have three bedrooms, but there was a garage space that had this like funky little room. And so my two oldest boys have been living in that garage room okay. and they're slowly fixing that area up. Cool. And then, so that's only two kids per room. So it doesn't really feel like that crazy. And then for the summer, my daughter just stayed in. I mean, last summer we all lived together and we didn't, we didn't even have the fixed up space. We were camping out in our trailer for part of the time. But, but this year when my daughter was home for the summer, the, the main living area in the garage was, was decent enough that she could have a hide to bed out there. And so, you know, we're, I don't think that two kids per bedroom is that big of a deal. We lived in Mexico with five kids in a room. Which was a big deal. Wow. <laughs> you know, so so I think that sometimes it's more about personal space, about managing each other in a room, you know, because you can get a kid in a room who's super messy and another one who's really tidy. And there can be conflicts that come about because of that. Mm -hmm. But as far as it's all fitting in the house, it doesn't feel like this big deal. And and the, the truth is my kids are getting older. I've got uh, – oldest son is home part-time because he's going to school about an hour and a half away. Okay. And then another child, my, my son who just turned 18 is heading off to, uh, like a, they call it a discipleship school. 
Mm-hmm. in the winter in January. So my husband and I know that we're on the verge of having only three or four kids at home. You know, so we really thought into the future as we bought this house, we thought, okay, we want a place where maybe it has some external living space where we could host guests or host children with their families. But that's also small enough that as our home gets emptier and emptier, because we're on that end of the, the family mm-hmm. spectrum, yeah. We're, we're not going to have this huge place to maintain because the, the truth is about a big house. It's also a bigger place to, if you have to recarpet, there's more square footage to recarpet. If you have to paint, there's more square footage to paint. So there's a lot of kind of hidden costs sometimes in having a bigger house. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. We're in an apartment right now and I am totally fine with it. <laughs> we, I will squeeze into it because we don't have a yard to mow. So it's really nice. Yeah. yeah there's definitely a lot of pros to living in a smaller space. Yeah. Okay. So you are also, you know, I know you homeschool your kids, but you're a work at home mom. You have the peaceful press. And so I would love for you to share with everyone what that is and, and how it kind of came about. And yeah. cause it's, it's a beautiful curriculum. It's oh my goodness. Gorgeous. I've, I've homeschooled for over 20 years. It's just, it's just something that I have loved doing. I love being with my kids. Mm-hmm. And so a few years ago, I did a little course for someone and I blogged off and on for a long time, but really had never taken the time to learn blogging and get good at it. Right. So a few years ago, I did a little course and it was really well received and it was based on preschool. And I love those preschool years, three to five they are just so engaging. And I've done a ton of research about it because my second daughter has some processing difficulty. So I'd always been really you know, learning and watching and trying to figure out the best way to help her. And so when I did this little preschool course, and it was well received. It was kind of the inspiration I needed to actually write down the thoughts that had been burning in my heart for so long. Yeah. Because it's so important for young children to have hands on learning. And often kids in school will start to have some difficulties learning. And it's because some of those foundational skills, it's like, Parents rushed ahead and did pencil work when what their children really needed was to play with clay or do fine motor work Mm -hmm. to develop strong pencil skills. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, people rush ahead and put their kids in front of worksheets when they really need some actual multi-sensory categorizing before they try doing that on a worksheet. So I'm really passionate about healthy development and learning in a, in a, sequential way that makes kids strong learners. And I've seen it work with my own children and there's so much research that backs it up. So I basically took all the stuff that I was passionate about and created parent guides that promote connection and that are hands-on and, and project based and that are fun because I don't think homeschooling education has to be a chore. And I, I kind of am always a little bit in awe of how well my children do in college based on how relaxed my schooling was. Because I think sometimes people are always feeling like, oh, doing enough, are my children learning enough? When it's actually a little bit simpler than we think. And if our children have in early childhood, good stories and lots of hands-on learning experiences, they're going to be set up to be really good learners and still retain the imagination that's needed for being creative people, people who can actually innovate and come up with solutions to changing problems. Yeah, and I've I've had uh, the ability to see your curriculum because uh, Kate actually has used it, and so I was able to look at it when I was at her house one day, and it is it is so um, well done. I I just think it's. Um, it's something that people who aren't even going to homeschool, maybe, maybe they don't think they're going to homeschool, but they have young children at home um, that are, you know, a preschool, right? I mean, this is, is based for preschool kids that um, they could really see a lot of value with it. So Right. And a lot of families do use my preschool guides because they're for ages three to five. And there's the main one, which is 26 
weeks since the letters of the alphabet. And then there's a few add-ons about different subjects like trees or the ocean. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people will use them as a two-day week supplement while the kids are at school a couple other days a week. But it just provides connection points because our children are longing to connect with us yeah. as parents yes. and to have time with us. And so it kind of gives us as parents ideas of what we can do with them to build those connection points. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I wish I would have had that when my kids were younger because that would have been, although I could, I could use it now. I could just use it now. They're, they're right. still not too young. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and I think it's funny because a lot of families will be doing the peaceful preschool or the playful pioneers and then older children will try to join in. They're like, which like, that looks cool. <laughs> I don't know when you get, yeah, I don't know when you get too old. It's interesting how in our minds we think, oh, yeah. they're in junior high or high school now, so they're not allowed to do art or hands on projects. Or, I mean, what, yeah. what happens with us, you know, because really there, there's not a time when they stop needing to yeah. play. I mean, yeah, it's like they That's say the so opposite true. of the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. So yeah. I think we all should, oh. should to some degree yeah. be playing. Yes. Oh, man. Totally. I completely agree. Um, So speaking of playing, it's getting towards Christmas time. And I know based on your Instagram, because it's so beautiful, um, that you and your family have some really great um, rituals and traditions that you do around Christmas time. And so if you don't mind, I would love for you to share maybe some things that our listeners could implement this Christmas um, that will bring that playfulness and that togetherness and allow us to, to really enjoy the season. This kind of can get busy, but we really try to make it not. So, <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I think one of the things that has really helped us as a family is not worrying about others' expectations or even cultural expectations. Mm-hmm. We've been very free to experiment you know, we, for a few years, we did the, as far as gift giving, we did one thing you want, one thing you need, something yes. to wear and something to read. And so yes. that kind of provided a boundary mm-hmm. for gift giving. And then another year we did an all used or handmade Christmas, okay. which was really fun. And then another year, our Christmas money went to a trip to Africa And so that year I, for our travel bags, like in everybody's backpack or whatever, I put kind of a goodie bag for the flight, which stood in the place of uh, stockings. Which stockings are like the funnest part. Right. Right. (laughs) I know. I love love stockings. (laughs) And then last year in Assisi, we told the kids that we weren't going to do Christmas presents, but I snuck into all the backpacks, like some used books and a few small puzzles and I mean, really small stuff and inexpensive stuff, but it was a magical Christmas. I mean, we were in a CC. I, I made cinnamon rolls with the Italian ingredients that I couldn't really read in this. <laughs> I mean, 1940s yeah. era stove that only three, three of the yeah. like heaters worked. So we, we, we may have the traditions, and I really surprised the kids with such small stuff, but it felt like the most extravagant Christmas ever. And I think that really traditions that center around togetherness are going to be the ones that make the stunning memories, you know, because I mean, obviously the CC trip was very extravagant to fly. It, there was eight of us because my second daughter was on an outreach trip, you know, to fly all of us to Italy was very extravagant. But what made it such a special was just being in that little place together and we didn't have any internet in the in the house. And so it was just a very bonding time. And I think that can happen at home. You know, it can be where you choose maybe one of the nights of Christmas to not go somewhere else or not invite other people. And I think that it's important to develop community and to have have a good relationship with extended family. But there is a place for making memories with your own nuclear family as well. And I think that that's been a big and special part of our traditions is just making sure we had some Christmas time together where we could build a puzzle and play a game and talk and just develop that relationship. And, you know, I think that our 
our traditions also don't center around extravagant gifts. I feel like my children, even though I don't buy a lot of toys and whatnot, because I've taken good care of the stuff that we have. I mean, I've been raising kids for 25 years, so I still have a box of wooden trains. I still have a box of Legos. I have a box of Playmobiles. You know, sometimes there's already too many toys and we don't want to be part of a problem of waste or plastic in landfills. And so as a family, I really am careful that toys that we buy are simple and a little bit smaller and not, and that kind of fit into categories that we already have Mm -hmm. so that I'm not trying to, you know, because what happens sometimes is we go all out for Christmas to impress our children. And there does come a point where it's not impressed anymore, you know, yeah. where we develop a kind of a never enough appetite in our children. Yes. And then, and then the days after Christmas, we're so frustrated because we're trying to get our kids to clean up their rooms and pick up their stuff. And we sort of created the problem. And so, you know, being, being aware of what the longer term consequences of our Christmas gift giving, I think is an important place to start because it is easy when you're in the stores and you're thinking about how much you love your kids to just yeah. go a little crazy. Yeah. And then later on, it actually interrupts relationships because there comes so much conflict with the organization of the toys. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, whew, yep. Especially if you don't have a lot of space to put them. Um, I, I guess my question to you would be how especially for younger kids, how would you, um, or what advice would you give to parents? Like my oldest is 10. And so I know she, she's pretty, I don't know. She's open to just travel or whatever. You know, she, she's fine with no toys. She's good with that. She, she kind of understands that. But my middle daughter who's nine, oh, she wants all the things. And if, you know, if she's not getting all of her gifts for her birthday or all the gifts for Christmas, she gets, you know, she's sad about it. And so how would you um, recommend um, or how did you even speak to your children about, say, going on a trip instead of receiving these gifts? Right. And I think that partly it's because it's a taste that we've cultivated. Yes. Yes. So there's not huge expectations, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then Often we would do things like the year that we did all used or homemade, I found uh, like my daughter had a, an American Girl doll that we bought at a thrift store, a yard sale or something, which was kind of a miracle. <laughs> and then and so I sewed the doll a nightgown and some bedding, you know, so there was some stuff that kind of went with a category. And and I think because it's always been simple and my kids aren't sitting in other people's homes watching them rip open a hundred presents. Mm-hmm. they're, they're maybe not even aware of what people have. And, and I think sometimes, you know, it's just the taste that we cultivate. Yeah. So I think if you want to really spoil your kids, get a bunch of craft kits where it's essentially something that you're going to use, you're going to do a project together. And then a lot of, you know, the cardboard packaging can be recycled and it's, mm-hmm. and it's kind of gone as opposed to a bunch of big plastic toys that you then have to store they both they both make an impact because I think it's just the opening of the toy. Do you know what I mean? I don't I don't know that they necessarily always are so impressed by what's inside. Yeah. It's yeah. just there's an excitement about having stuff to open. Yeah, and so, so true. you know, making having those wrapped gifts be things that maybe create a memory or that can be done together, mm-hmm. and then sort of disappear as opposed to things that are going to take up a bunch of space. Yeah. So we get this question a lot around Christmas time. We get this question a lot, not around Christmas time, actually, but anytime we discuss gifts or anything like that, the question that is asked the most is how do you deal with in-laws or parents or just grandparents in general? How do you deal with telling them that because I'll be honest, like in my situation, my husband and I, we don't we don't have a ton of money to buy extravagant things or a lot of things. You know, maybe we can just buy one thing. Um, but then we go to other places <laughs> where they are receiving more gifts and it's um, it's always so much. And so how would you recommend dealing with that? Yeah, I, I think for one thing, not being offensive, like 
I, I think you can really hurt grandparents' feelings by yes. being too bossy about it. And yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, we, in our family, the grandparents have a lot of grandchildren, so we don't have the issue of, of too much stuff coming from them. But I think if, you know, if they were willing to give stuff to my kids, I wouldn't be like, oh, we don't want that gross thing. But I would, you know, there's a couple of things that I would do. One thing is if they ask or if there's any opportunity to say, hey, this is something my child, you know, has been really wanting or what about some lessons or some art classes or an opportunity to go to a pottery, yeah. a pottery workshop? You know, if there's any opportunity to suggest something that's more in line with your family's values. Otherwise, I'd say open the toy, say thank you very much, play with it for a few days and then donate it to somebody who needs it. Yes. Yeah, that's great. I like that idea because it's you want to be gracious and you want to be thankful for the things that you are given and yet and you don't want to offend and yet yeah you don't want it to just sit in the kids room because I know that's happened quite a bit for us um, and we were actually lucky enough my parents last year we were like hey what about horse riding lessons and so we did we actually did that with uh, with my girls and that was great they didn't they got to use the horse riding lessons and that was it <laughs> right that's so. amazing when when grandparents are thoughtful enough to say you know is there an experience that your mm -hmm. children would want instead but for sure usually grandparents are trying their best to love your kids yeah and they don't necessarily know and so just being being kind and thankful in the moment and then don't don't feel bad about stuff kind of disappearing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they won't know. Um, so do you guys have any plans for this Christmas? We're actually going to be home for the first time in a few years. So we're, we're doing the something you want, something you need, something to wear, something to read. Awesome. And uh, it'll, you know, it'll still be fairly simple because we are also planning this trip to Europe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which will be, you know, it'll be a short trip. But and and doing a little bit more fixing up on the fixer up here. So yeah. so it'll be simple, but definitely some of our main traditions are singing together, having stockings. Christmas morning is always so special with yeah. kind of the traditional breakfast that we've done, even when we're in some weird situation like living in Mexico with only a toaster oven or <laughs> staying in a house in Assisi with which. Oh, my goodness. No recipe or ingredients. I have so many more questions for you. We're going to have to have you back on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That sounds awesome. Uh, well, so you had wanted to give our listeners um, something special for the Peaceful Press. And so why don't you let them know where they can find you and just all that good stuff. Okay. We're on the internet at thepeacefulpress.com and we have a Christmas guide available that you can get with 20% off with code cohesive home. Thank you so much for, for coming on and chatting with me. I know I'm, <laughs> I just like, I just like chatting. That's really all I like. I know. And there's <laughs> so much to talk about. It's like, we never even got to talk about living off the grid or living in a travel trailer. There's so many things. So, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Yes. One of these days we'll have to have another conversation. That's so true. We didn't even deep dive into that. Darn. Um, yeah. We'll have to have you on again for sure. Thank you, Melissa. This has been really fun to chat with you. Thank you again, Jennifer, so much for joining me on the Cohesive Home Podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. And if you would like to connect with Jennifer on Instagram or her website, or even take advantage of that 20% off code, head to our show notes for all of the links and ways to connect with her. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, and we'll see you next time.